Hello and welcome to Therapist Connect Broadcasts. Um, my name's Kaz Binstead and I'm the co-lead here at Therapist Connect. Um, and uh, we're here today uh, for what I think will be a very special and interesting um, interview with, um, with Andy Rogers, who I'm going to introduce properly in a moment. Um, some of you will know that Therapist Connect has a birthday in January, uh, we're four in January, and um, each time we have one of these special occasions, um, Peter and myself um, invite um, somebody that we think um, has contributed significantly to our profession and we invite them to come along for what we call um, lifetime achievement interview. Um, so my choice this year is um, is Andy. And the reason why um, I've, I've chosen Andy is because um, I obviously stand a lot for working therapists, you know, people who are actually out there doing this work day in, day out. Um, and uh, uh, Andy is one of those people. He's also contributed to our profession in many other ways. Um, so he's worked as, um, as a therapist for around 25 years, 25 years this year. Um, and he, he kind of uh, started off uh, by being employed for 20 years as a counsellor, counselling services coordinator and colleges of uh, further and higher education in um, Hampshire. Um, he's now working in private practice. Um, he's also been very involved um, for much of his career in um, activism around professional issues. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, and he has numerous publications, which we're also going to touch on. Um, one of those publications being um, the co-author of um, the very popular student book, First Steps in Counselling. So... Welcome, Andy. Well, thanks very much. And uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me. And uh, yeah, I'm very honoured and moved. Um, and a little bit of me is not sure I feel deserving of the <laughs> accolade <laughs> of lifetime achievement. But um, it's really good to hear what you're saying about working therapists, because um, yeah, I have a lot of respect for people who are sort of honing their craft for, you know, months and years of practice and um uh, i think that's really important because not everyone can be chairs of organizations or um do all the other more sort of high profile things you know a lot of us are just working as you say day in day out honing our work and um and 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 really doing that but also contributing here and there where where we can and i guess that's you know what i've tried to do around some of the issues that the professional issues which we'll talk about i guess but um yeah thank you Absolutely, it's a pleasure. Um, so let's start by why you decided to become a therapist and just let's talk about your training, which was obviously, um, you know, a number of years ago. So why did you decide to become a therapist? Um, that's a it's always a really tricky question, isn't it? I think because there's so many different answers. There's a kind, there's a kind of straightforward answer, which is that I'd left university, uh, was working in, um, uh, I was going to say a record shop, an HMV, you know, and uh, having lots of fun, a bunch of friends, and but not really feeling like I was working in a sort of meaningful job that was rewarding at a deeper level. And uh, I had a degree just about in sociology, and uh, I was looking at what I might do. I thought about social work because you could do a top-up year to go into social work um but I ended up needing some uh like caring helping uh experience voluntary helping yeah, work experience and um to do that so I volunteered at a youth counseling agency and then just sort of got hipped into it really did the basic training very quickly found person-centered theory um and got very immersed in that and then just sort of shot off from there. Um, the deeper question of why any any of us end up doing this work, um, you know, I'm not sure I can go into a huge amount of depth with, but, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why as a person I think I was drawn to. I had therapy myself um, before ever being a therapist or ever being interested in being a therapist and had contact with uh, mental health services as well. And so that 
intrigued me and I was off I suppose I was always interested in subjectivity and perception and why people feel the things they do um and felt very drawn to that but also I mean I guess I was quite a political person even as a youngster so there's something about therapeutic practice and the and power and the you know justice of giving voice to things which haven't had a voice um I think that all sort of weaves in plus all sorts of things from my early history I'm sure which meant I got drawn to this but yeah 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 that makes that makes a lot of sense it's funny isn't it when you think about who you are as a person like what you've studied before and of course I think you'll agree with me on this you know as therapists we are not just we don't just suddenly become therapists we have our own life experience and you know uh, maybe studied other other related um, disciplines that are mm -hmm. really useful to us as therapists yeah, I always felt sociology was a sort of quite a good grounding in a strange way. I, I remember doing a, I did a unit, I think, in the first year of um, psychology and just found it horrendous and left. <laughs> so I don't know quite how that tied in, but, but it was so dry and seemed to be very keen on sort of um, giving everything a kind of category and explanation. And for me, therapy is almost the opposite of that, even though it's a psychological practice. So um yeah, uh, and, and I suppose the sociology and the politics angle gave me a sort of broader picture of therapy always as existing within a culture and within a society, you know. Um, so that that's not, some, not something I sort of picked up later, that I sort of came into the work with that, you know, that it's not just about dealing with an individual in the therapy session, that we're, we work within a profession which exists within a society, which is a certain kind of culture and um around mental health and distress so yeah I saw and um, when I was reading your CV I saw that you'd done a uh, a later A level in philosophy as well that you'd done your A levels but then you'd done that uh, just because I'd studied philosophy so that kind of stood stood out at me yeah that's interesting on that I, I felt like I needed a bit some insight really um, I mean, I was I was reading lots of sort of therapy books and critical psychology books and lots of things which had a lot of philosophical content. And I thought just as a kind of bit of self-development, I'd go back and do an A-level. And I, I never actually completed it because I left uh, before the end because I, I don't know what philosophy we're doing, but we did uh, some existentialism, Sartre and existentialism and humanism, that book, and um, some Wittgenstein and a couple of other things. And then... I felt like I'd got what I needed and just um, ne never actually took the exam. So, uh, yeah, I did the course. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, I've always been drawn to philosophical ideas, although I don't, I mean, and I've been to university, obviously, and done some writing, but I don't really see myself as particularly academic in that way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, not as an, an academic, if you know what I mean. So, yeah. yeah. That's an interesting point, isn't it? Um, yeah. Whether whether people are academics or whether people can be academic um, and you know get their degrees and things like that, but um, maybe we will touch on this today because particularly when it comes to therapy, um, there's something important about kind of uh, I guess knowing theories, knowing uh, being able to think about things, you know, in a philosophical way or whatever it might be. But of course, therapy is is so much more than that. Um, mm. One thing I just wanted to pick up from about your training just before we move on, um, you mentioned that you were pretty young when you did the training. Yeah, I suppose it seemed, um, well, it seemed in the perception of other people quite young. Uh, I was in my mid-20s when I started training and I was sort of mm -hmm. completed initial training by before I was 30. Um, on my course, my uh, I did a postgraduate diploma at the University of East Anglia, and um, which was a big person-centred course at the time. Uh, led by Brian Thorne and Judy Moore, who's a great writer on feminism and person-centred theory uh, and focusing. Um, and there was, I think there was three of us who were sort of under 30. Um, I mean, it's just something I've been quite passionate about because, uh, uh, you know, not hugely, because I, but there was, there was some, uh, you know, judgment about that I felt within the profession that as it, that younger people somehow don't have enough life experience um, or haven't been through enough to you know young adults haven't been through enough to be able to practice and I mean obviously I disagreed because I did it but I also found that during training in fact younger people sometimes 
are able to sort of um, learn the kind of therapeutic way of being um, from because they have that kind of evolving kind of freshness about things. Whereas sometimes older people are having to unlearn stuff that have been very entrenched in their way of being and their way of thought about helping and relationships. So, um, yeah, I'm always really inspired and encouraging of younger people to get into the work. Yeah, absolutely. It's really, um, you know, viewers really need to understand this. That it's quite it was it was quite a thing. Um, I mean, I, I started my training in 2009 and I was kind of. Uh, I think towards my late 20s and even then it was a thing if you were in your 20s so to have trained 25 years ago so obviously there's a there's more young people that train today um, but yeah so that that was really I guess something something in itself and I guess um, were you on a course that was mainly predominantly female as well or was it like that in those days or yeah it tended to be there was quite a few men on our course but I think it was a bit of an anomaly it was, it was quite unusual they said for there to be as many men on that course at the time um I can't remember remember the pro, pro, the proportion but it was yeah there was a fair few but it was quite a female you know a profession and a lot of the people training would be female yeah yeah you talk there about encouraging young people to come into this profession and obviously a lot of your work has been working with young people so how did you get into that how did you find that um I mean it was a strange one because I came out of my training um and was just sending out um prospective sort of letters to people to sort of uh, organizations to try and get work and I heard back from a local college who happened to be the college that I studied A levels at, and the student services manager was the person that taught me for A level politics, and they'd moved on to be work in student services. And they said, "Well, we've got some counselling happening, but it's in those days there was a lot of places had ad hoc counselling, so a teacher or a lecturer might do some of the counselling on the side, proper." you know often no real um dedicated room within the college um but they were thinking of uh, developing a more professional service and i was brought in uh for a day a week on a contract for a year i think initially to look at the whether there was a need for counseling uh like a more established service and to offer some counseling work myself i mean so really lucky to come out of training and walk and you know go straight into some paid work fairly soon afterwards um but it was you know initially a contract which then rolled over into another year and expanded and over time um just sort of grew and grew and until eventually I was f pretty much full-time um but yeah so it was a, a kind of accident really uh I never particularly intended to that I wanted to work with younger people um but really enjoyed it in, um you know working in that kind of environment there's lots of challenges uh very different to private practice or other sectors perhaps um but the client group are always inspiring their sort of resourcefulness the the way they take to therapy to counseling um you know we were offering longer term work which is quite unusual now in that kind of sector um uh, so very lucky to be allowed to do that on the whole the college seemed to trust that I knew what I was doing and that and the longer term work was possible my, my, it, when you averaged it out most clients came for uh, you know less sessions I think the average ended up being like six sessions you know the magical six sessions thing but within that you'd be seeing some people through their whole college lives um, so a real privilege to be able to do that kind of work in that kind of setting uh, and seeing people sort of just grow and develop and uh, and take to that kind of work at a time when you know CBT was becoming very dominant, the whole uh, dominance of short term working and the pressure to work in those kinds of ways. Um, to see people you know really embrace longer term humanistic person centered working um, was very, just very inspiring to me. Yeah, absolutely. So it's the, it's the work and the clients that were really yeah I guess inspiring you um why did you because you also mentioned challenges why did you decide to move on from that uh again that's a, that's a question with lots of answers but there's um 
I mean, there's a lots of challenges challenges of working in that kind of organisation, an organisation which isn't a counselling organisation. So you're always kind of peripheral to the core business, you know, the core work of the of the organisation. And there's an advantage in that because you can, you know, create a kind of separateness, uh, which is helps with confidentiality and just the whole, you know, sense of the service service being a discrete thing to access. Um, but it can mean that you're you know, all, one of the first uh, departments to be looked at when there's um, restructures and they're thinking about how to save money and services in FE are often under threat of closure or get closed. And yeah, having been through a few rounds of restructures, saving the service by the skin of our teeth, and um, that, that can just be quite demoralizing, I think, you know, to feel that you're, that you're, you're, you're told you're valued, but only to an extent and uh, and, it, and it's not really anyone's fault in the in the situation because FE is under so much pressure financially and it's a hugely neglected area of the education system um uh, so but it just creates a kind of culture which is can be uh quite difficult to spend a lot of time in and and to not feel really valued within um you have to be quite resilient in that i mean some of the time i was there i was working as a loan counselor as well um which was fine but you know i i quite naturally seemed to warm to that but um but it sort of a can when you you don't feel hugely valued as well it adds to a sort of sense of slightly of being a bit isolated and yeah just dispirited really um but the work with clients would always kind of keep me there because that would give you that kind of sense of the real value in what you were doing but eventually that tension I think between uh myself as an organizational being if you like and as a therapist to the students um it just became sort of unsustainable there's something that's sort of about the the cycle of the academic year as well because there's a huge amount of intensity in working in that kind of service you're often running running a waiting list um so you're you're sort of holding the pressure of all the people that are waiting as well as seeing the people you're seeing um, there's never enough resources to have extra counselors and uh so you work really hard you probably work a bit too hard and then you kind of collapse and try and recuperate in the breaks which there's a few of because it's the academic year so you get nice holidays but you're often uh, i think a lot of teachers would recognize this of getting to the end of term and suddenly being ill and you know because your, your sort of body sort of gives up the fight to keep going and then recuperating and then starting all over again and there can be a kind of there can be a sort of buzz to that in a strange way you know a kind of um uh it gives you a sort of little hit of sort of adrenaline but each time uh but i think over time i think 20 years was too long really to be to be in that loop and i and yeah i was becoming quite disillusioned um, and it, uh, in a way, sort of being involved in activism in the profession as well, which is often is a kind of um, the art of sort of retaining hope in lost causes <laughs> that, that, that you know, that can eat away at it a bit. And I really needed to do something to refresh. And I was lucky to have people around me who believed in me that I could leave that situation and, you know, and build a private practice. So, uh I'm, I'm really thankful to them for doing that because I'm not sure I fully believed it myself, even after, even though I had all that experience. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say you did amazingly well 20 years. That is a long time. And of course, a lot of what you're saying there is what so many working therapists talk about feeling not valued, demoralized because of like lack of funding in, in our profession. Like you say, you know, that leads to kind of constant restructures and things like that. Um, um, and the contrast then with the actual work that you're doing as a therapist and, you know, um, how difficult that can be to balance. Yeah. So, I mean, there is, a, there is a real tension there and you've got to somehow find a way of having the energy and resources in yourself to do the work, which obviously gives you a lot back as well, but it can all start to feel a bit out of balance, I think. Yeah. Well, um, I think we might um, we might move into activism as you have mentioned it there. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, you have been um, yeah you've been involved in um, uh, 
so much actually and you've you've written a lot of stuff um you said you said earlier that you were kind of a little bit that way inclined but what was your first uh, what was your kind of first um outing I guess in this arena I think it, it came about through writing first really you know um I, th- I was writing something very soon after leaving training about I was thinking about this earlier. I think I was trying to write something about integrating the sort of focusing experiential theory of like the felt sense into a that being the chain. The chain. I'm not, I don't know. I'm laughing, but it's it's kind of um, it just seems a bit like like I was really desperate to to, to you know, write something important about theory, but trying to. Make, um, but then I became quite interested in my experience of being a therapist and what I was seeing in terms of. Um, I guess issues of justice and um, uh, the way the profession operated and power was misused and started to write about that and at the time the debate was sort of rumbling quite loudly around regulation statutory regulation of uh, counselling and psychotherapy Uh, and I wrote a couple of things related to that um, in kind of like relatively small person-centred journals um, and I mean, I'd have to go back and really look, but but somewhere along the line, um, uh, I was in touch with two really influential influential people in my writing, but also my, I guess my activism would be uh, Richard House and uh, Yvonne Bates, um, who both um, really encouraged my writing. Uh, Yvonne Bates used to do a small journal or, or kind of magazine for the independent practitioners. You know, it was literally like a, photocopied you know <laughs> paper thing you know that which yeah. got sent out and um but really like lively debate often really inclusive of the client voice way ahead of its time really uh in- incorporating people who are very co- critical of therapy as a as an enterprise for, for all sorts of political and other reasons and sort of debating in print um around those kinds of issues uh sort of I suppose led me into certain spaces and then um when uh the the uh regulation thing that was started with the HPC regulation the health professions council regulation proposal which some people watching may may or may not know about but um this is in the sort of mid to late 2000s if I've got my chronology right there um and I ended up being invited into what was the had just started out the Alliance for Counselling and Psychotherapy, who are a bunch of people who are very active on this issue of opposing regulation by the HPC. So, um, yeah, that was my real step into activism as opposed to just writing, you know, stuff and sending it out and occasionally getting printed. Yeah. And yet, for people who don't know, um, of course, you can read up about this on the probably on the Alliance's site. Um, But, you know, it was really, um, really a big thing to stop that uh, because, of course, um, the uh, psychology profession um, was regulated, did get regulated by um, HCPC. um, And there were many, many debates of which we will been used to more recently in terms of talking about regulation or some kind of uh, semi-regulation so for the work that actually the activists within the counseling and psychotherapy world were doing um that was that was big big stuff actually yeah it was I mean it was a it was a sort of baptism of fire for me really I mean a great education in therapy politics you know um there's lots of really you know big thinkers, if you like, and practitioners in the Alliance in the, in the original days um, from the humanistic world, Richard House, Dennis Postal, and you had a bunch of Lacanian psychoanalysts, uh, Andrew Samuels from the Jungian world. So, you know, um, sort of real kind of coming together of thinkers across kind of modality divides who are always sort of united with their sort of uh, very principled stance. Um, but also getting involved in the sort of nitty gritty of politics and how to try and change things, you know, um, from writing letters, doing petitions. Um, we we did sort of local outreach group work around the issue to try and spread the word of what was going on. It was just, I mean, Facebook and stuff was, was around them, but it wasn't quite, you know, I'm not sure how many therapists would have been tuned into it. So 
it was a lot of a lot more legwork really and emailing and writing and and that kind of stuff yeah and conferences yeah there was a couple of alliance conferences around that time um mm -hmm. which uh yeah i think they all contributed to uh to actually getting that proposal stopped because it was i mean it was deeply inappropriate proposal for therapy uh, mm -hmm. deeply medicalized the hpc was a very medical oriented organization um so um yeah that was I mean, the campaign was successful, but it also gave me an insight into the kind of the challenges of being a campaigner and an activist. Yeah, which um, I'm sure you're well aware of. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Well, well, that's a nice uh, feed into um, uh, scoped because I guess when I'm uh, I'm for people people scoped scoped hashtag scoped hashtag grim reaper whatever you care to call it. Um, um, you know when I'm listening to you talk here and then I'm thinking about the work that you've tried to do to um, to challenge this framework, um, I don't know, how does it feel, the fact that, I mean, it's being pushed through? Yeah, <laughs> I sort of deep sigh, try to gather myself to talk about scopes again, because it sometimes I feel like everything that's ever, that's could possibly be said on scopes probably been said and yet it kind of just sort of you know drives on in its kind of unremitting kind of way um uh and it felt like that a lot with regulation at the time you know um and it was always important to um I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, but Andrew Samuels always used to say that, you know, when, during the regulation thing, that, that it probably will happen, like we probably will lose. And um, there's something about being as, trying to sort of hold that and still keep going is important in activism. Um, and what the Alliance taught me was that sometimes change is possible, but that it's very hard and often it doesn't happen. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not worth trying at the same time. Um, and so, yeah, my heart sinks when I have to talk about scoped in a way. And I've probably written more on scoped than anything else. And that sort of makes my heart sink a bit as well. Um, because it's so unnecessary and just such an imposition that no one really asked for and doesn't really achieve anything, certainly not what's claimed for it. Um, and won't achieve anything other than making things worse or more difficult or or, or just being a kind of irrelevance which has um which which has some sort of unintended negative side effects you know consequences um so to be sort of i mean the thing about the scoped campaign really that for me it's been sort of that has, that's been inspiring and heartening and uh is to see a sort of new I sound really sort of old and seen enough, but like like a new generation. Don't be the wise, the wise person, please. <laughs> <laughs> the wise elder, you know, which is strange as I'm thinking about it, because when I was in the Alliance, I was in my early 30s, I guess, early mid 30s, and there were all these sort of senior people who had been around forever, like arguing about these things. Um, but to see a sort of new generation of therapists stand up, um, one of my fears are in the alliance was as we all got older you know and people retired and moved on you know who's gonna you know stand up for the same things but i feel really reassured and obviously social media has helped that a great deal for all its faults you know um uh so to see younger therapists standing up on a whole range of issues um is just really encouraging you know and to, kn to know that you know i don't have to you know me or whoever don't have to do everything we can share the load of this um is is just really important yeah absolutely um yeah it really is important i think that's a big part of activism actually actually knowing that you can share the load you can get support um i'm very inspired by you um um you always talk with your heart and i love that and i just tune into that and it also this is for the viewers um uh, we we both kind of got a, a foot in the uh, PCU, the Psychotherapy and Counselling Union um, campaign on Scoped. Um, so they've been kind of a, in, against it since the beginning, but they've got a formal campaign now. And um, 
um, they asked me to um, to run this campaign and I was like, no way, absolutely not. And I wrote them an email telling them all the reasons why I wouldn't, which included, you know, feeling traumatized and, you know, it's too exhausting and all of that. And then uh, they went and asked Andy as well whether he would run the campaign. And um, when you came to the meeting, literally everything you said, almost word for word, I was just sitting there going, Yes, that's what I said in my email. It was almost exactly the same because it is a really, it's a really heavy load. But like you said, it's that kind of hmm. holding hope. Yeah. And knowing this might not get us anywhere. Yeah. And it, I, I mean, I'm not even sure. I mean, obviously, it's helpful to have people leading things, but good activism should be sort of, sort of multifaceted and sort of like, just like you know, a bunch of things happening all at the same time from all different groups of people who are doing it spontaneously and we all support each other to do those things. You know, that's part of what good activism can be about rather than sort of having a figurehead who sort of leads something. But obviously there's a role for, you know, for leading here and there, but not something I was wanting to take on. Yeah. yeah. Because it does wear you out, you know. I mean, it's, it's. I mean, I think sometimes almost the way we can be portrayed and um sort of well ignored or belittled by the people we're arguing you know by the bigger organizations is as if we're sort of like troublemakers who sort of somehow get off on this or something you know that the that the, we just do it for because we like to have a bit of a fight and nearly everyone i know involved in activism finds it really hard work it takes a toll to be in a kind of anti mindset you know all the time when you're you know it, it, not anti everything but anti the thing you're trying to stop or confront you know it does something to the psyche you know you like you're in a certain way of being the whole time um and moving between that and therapy where you're, you know as a therapist you're obviously holding hope and but also being with darkness at the same time so it can be quite a dark place, you know, like you have to really start to think about, well, do I need to step away? How do I, you know, feel better about the world and myself within it um, and still maintain this work? I mean, there's lots of other good things that come out of activism, and the connection with people, you know, the sense of purpose and value and meaning and what you're, do you're doing. I'm not sort of like portraying it as this sort of terrible poison chalice that only the brave pick up you know it's kind of like but it can wear you out yeah I mean it can take a real toll on on your energy as a person um because often you're just constantly being confronted with no you know or or being ignored you know um I think Nick Totten used this phrase of like um that around that regulation that we were being ignored to death that that was the that was the policy and uh and the scoped organizations uh try to say they're listening and are engaged whilst underneath they're really just ignoring us until we go away i think yeah absolutely absolutely all that folks if you need to like rewind and listen to some of that again please do because um so many important words that andy's just said there um and uh you know andy you talked at the beginning about power and I think this kind of uh, touches on what you're on what you're saying there. You know, people are just being troublemakers. It's because you know um, people feel very, very strongly about things. And um, I always think of that. Uh, I quoted it last week actually when I was doing a workshop on activism, a bell hooks quote, which is you know about. Um, well, I guess it's all the same kind of thing. You know uh, that we're all different, and we you know there's something so valuable about you know community voices and uh I, I mean for me and I guess for you as well you know actually what therapy is what it means to people what it means to clients um and of course you know how things are in reality for working practitioners mm -hmm. yeah and, and the power runs through all of these things you know um and as therapists, we I hope we're really tuned into kind of interpersonal power and the impact of uh, the misuse of power, whether it's by people in our clients' lives or or how they're treated by the culture. But those kinds of things, uh, that same operation of power is runs through all of therapy politics. You know the way that organisations conduct themselves, the question of who benefits, is, you know, in any 
kind of political move that happens in the professions. Um, it's, and it's very rarely seems to be clients or or on the ground practitioners who are benefiting, you know, from some of these moves. That's not to say that everything the big one big organisations are doing is wrong, or that the people are some, you know, these kind of terrible kind of the intentioned, you know, um, characters. I mean, I'm sure they think they're doing the right things, but they're caught in a kind of sort of network of power, if you like, where and seem to me sort of out of touch with therapeutic values and um, certainly the training and my development as a practitioner was about therapeutic values not just being something that was there when you're sitting with a client in a session but that informed your life and your whole approach to the world and that therapy organizations should embody them as much as possible and I, I, I really question how whether that's the case with them with the big organizations for many years now. Absolutely. Well, let's move on to um, the type of therapy that you practice and that you write about. You were trained in person-centered therapy. You're obviously uh, big in the person-centered movements, but you are you use the term humanistic psychology. So maybe explain to people um, who don't know, you know, uh, yeah, where you sit with um, humanistic practice. Well, that's that's a big question, Cass. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. We're going to go over. We were saying at the beginning, I said, these things normally take about 50, 45 minutes. And Andy said to me, oh, you're on the therapeutic clock. And I was <laughs> like, I hadn't thought that. But, you know, we've got we've got as much time as we need. OK, I, I'll, I'll do my best. But I think part of why I'm saying that is that um, my writing, I suppose, has always been about trying to wrestle with something in myself, you know, what... What do I believe about something? What what's what's niggling me about something that I've read or seen happen, or or that I experience in in therapy and the therapy professions? And coming out of, so I trained on a very very person centered course. You know, I mean, it's kind of course which probably couldn't exist now. Uh, it was closed down a few years ago, in fact. Um, uh, because it's uh, it was a postgraduate diploma. In a university setting, but was um, uh, in a way quite non-academic because it was a deep, very experiential. Um, the whole assessment process at the end, we self and peer assessed, so we didn't pass exams or anything. We had, a, you know, we created a sort of self-assessment document which we spent a week talking with people in our group about and working out whether we felt able to to uh, graduate really yeah so um uh so i came out of that training i mean i was a bit of a dogmatist really i was, I was you know very passionate about the person-centered approach quite anti anything that wasn't person-centered uh quite dogmatic about it uh but that quickly changed i think i mean i started to in i just felt really drawn to interrogating things i'd learned so i i I was never willing to just accept a, a big idea because someone kind of famous had said it, you know, or that it was an established notion in in, in any field, really, but particularly in therapy. Um, so I started to sort of question aspects of the person-centered approach, and, and and but also the therapy enterprise generally, and got very immersed in the kind of critical literature around therapy for anything from like um, Jeffrey Mason, the uh, Against Therapy books, famous, and still really important in a way although a bit dated now book on um i mean principally talking about psychoanalysis but also other approaches and about the the critique of therapy from a political perspective as a kind of individualizing potentially kind of neoliberal enterprise um and so got really immersed in all that and trying to this is while working as a therapist so i was dealing with those kind of conflicts in myself of i could really understand the critique and but i could also see the value in what I was doing and what my colleagues were doing um so trying to sort of hold those or, or, or sort of work those things out really and it i mean some of the early things i wrote about that that's what make me cringe a bit now because but they were because they're really fraught and kind of like angsty you know um mm -hmm. but it was just something i needed to work through and uh i think in psychoanalysis they have this thing is about like killing the father you know i, I there's, there was something about sort of needing to take Carl Rogers down so that I could find my own practice. Um, and for a while, I wasn't sure that I really called myself person-centred. Um, but 
I mean, I've described it before as being a bit like a sort of old worn out armchair that I would, you know, that I would feel comfortable in, but it wasn't quite, it wasn't all that I was somehow, but I'd always end up coming back and sitting in it. Um, so yeah, over time, I mean, I, person sense where it's just in my, you know, I started training at 25, I'm 51. You know, it's over half my entire life I've been a person sensitive stroke humanistic therapist. Um, and for the vast majority of my adult life, you know, this is what I've done. So it's kind of in my bones in that way. Um, but I never really moved into, even though I was wrestling with, you know, aspect, theoretical aspects or philosophical parts of the approach and the politics of person centered approach, I didn't find myself drawn to working more integratively or or training in other approaches um so it just became i suppose it became an aspect of me as a practitioner that i had this kind of i want to say in an inner critic and i don't mean that in the way we normally talk about it in therapy of being something that we would like to soften its kind of tone towards us but a really valued kind of inner critic where i could hold the kind of critique of therapy and of humanistic work or person-centered approach specifically and find enough kind of sense of groundedness within it and value in it that I believed in it enough to do it you know so um yeah that's good does that make sense <laughs> it makes a lot of sense and I think it's absolutely wonderful um and I think that as therapists I mean personally I, I am integrative so I've had to give a little bit of thought as to what that means for me um but I think it's so important isn't it and actually mm -hmm. work is much more meaningful then because you know exactly why you're doing something um, yeah that's, that's exactly right yeah it's about it's about like having that kind of foundation within yourself so that you can feel that when you're sitting there that you're that you're grounded in something and you may feel all at sea and oh you know not know what you're doing in one you know at some point in some session somewhere but that overall you feel like yeah I know why I'm here you know and I know and I know what I'm offering um even though xyz things you know D d critical things about this or, or things which we might question about this I, I i you know that i'm i feel grounded enough in what i believe that i can do this you know because it's about stepping into i mean i'm trying to write something about this at the moment which is why it's very much on my mind but it's about stepping into not knowing that like i mean this is the essence of person-centered therapy is uh, peter schmidt call it like the art of not knowing and I know like that's been used before by psychoanalysis and other uh, orientations, but it's really, it is really about being able to be with not knowing and be with the distress of someone else without solutions to that distress, without, um, you know, um, knowing the way forward and without too much fear or anxiety. And so to not feel too anxious about that, you need something in yourself to, to hang on to. It needs a kind of a footing in the world. So, um, so, and it's about finding your own version of that, you know, for everyone. And so my sort of mix of persons entered plus sort of critical theory, plus a bit of politics and dash of existentialism and, you know, and I, I suppose all these things for me are like, I'm quite interested in psychoanalytic concepts. I've been, you know, over the years, read a lot of stuff around that. And I don't really use them in my work in a psychoanalytic way. They're, they're things which anything which can enhance or sort of broaden the kind of bandwidth of empathy and relational connection and can open you as the practitioner to the nuance and complexity of what someone is saying is valuable so you don't need to implement those theories you know um it's like say practicing in a psychoanalytic way by offering interpretations or anything but you can just um use them so that you can your empathy is not superficial you know that it's deeper and a, a kind of enhanced and broadened um and that was always the value to me with thinking about things beyond one approach and not being a kind of dogmatist or a kind of but i, I really respect you know purists in any approach because i think there's real value in that and in a, in a way I've, I've sort of been one and sort of am one um but with a unique take and i think as therapists over the over time I think we all start to sort of 
become our own version of a therapist rather than a just a person-centered or just a TA therapist or whatever yeah absolutely and I think it's it's also just it's being authentic isn't it and it's kind of modeling that to clients as when you were talking about all oh, some of my early writings as well or you know but I think that's important actually because that is all about not not being perfect not knowing all the answers exactly what you're talking about being able to be in that unknown place when you're doing critical reflection mm. um, and I do think there's something really important about that authenticity yeah I mean and, and I mean in terms of the person-centered approaches of you know it's it's plight or it's predicament now and humanistic work generally. I mean, it's really, in a kind of political way or a kind of structural way, the extent to which it has influence or power within the profession, you know, it's it's sort of been struggling for some time really. Um, and it's, it's struggled to have an impact beyond, you know, um, certainly had very little impact in the NHS, although you've got counseling for depression, which is a sort of essentially a, a kind of, person-centered therapy humanistic approach sort of adapted for the sort of nhs setting but the, the actual is not commonly offered in the way that cbt is so i mean it's in quite a precarious position in some ways um but i suppose there's a kind of hope and despair thing about that too you know it's there's always pockets of hope and in the person-centered approach there are the, there's a small handful of really deeply person-centered courses running like the one uh peter the peter blundell therapist connect co-lead uh works on a, a liverpool john moores and uh the uh stephen joseph and david murphy at uh, university of nottingham um and there's some others around so th that gives me hope that, that those courses are still attracting a lot of people to train you know and um but just mostly the hope comes from the work because you just people uh, clients i mean you know it look like they they warm to it and they are drawn to it and they understand it and they intuitively uh in, kind of embrace it and get a lot out of it and while that's still the case you know i think there's there's always hope if, for, for it as an you know as an entity in the professional field but it has been disregarded and i mean scope's a classic example of the way that the person-centered approach has been sidelined and um the kind of uh and, and i guess you could argue that's just because in a way it's too confrontational you know despite the sort of image of person-centered therapists as like these sort of warm you know kind of friendly <laughs> understanding <Okay. laughs> yeah. um that 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 it's a confrontational position you know like roger said it's a kind of revolutionary you know stance and I think that can be overplayed as well this is my grappling you see I'm doing it now back and forth between those things but it um it does confront a lot of the kind of conventions of uh mental health practice um even now so and perhaps more so now than it did you know in the 60s when it was thriving so now um we've, we've touched a little bit on your writing um some of your your writing in activism um you've done a little bit of um editing as well from 2012 to 2015 you were the column editor at self and society on the ethical dilemmas and disclosures um and uh, other bits of writing. And of course, uh, most recently, um, you were co-author uh, with um, I'm thinking of the big figures in, in the person-centered field. So co-author with um, uh, Pete Sanders, the late Pete Sanders and uh, Paula Williams. So how did that come about? How did you find that experience? Uh, with First Steps. First Steps, yeah. Yeah. Um, I did not really know, although, We'd, I think Pete was aware of Pete Sanders was aware of my writing, and I was obviously aware of his, you know, amazing body of work uh, on the person-centered approach. And um, I mean, I've never been one for a big sort of conference goer or anything, so I, I was often not really very well connected to, you know, apart from in the alliance through uh, in the, the activist side within the person-centered world for a long time, I wasn't really very well connected and didn't know people, so. Um, but we, I did go to some uh, to something and he was there and he sort of 
came up to me and said, oh, I've been meaning to all these years and we've never kind of connected and we had a little chat at the bookstall. And, and he said, oh, I've got a thing I want to run by you sometime, but I'll, I'll, I'll email you. And then nothing happened for ages, <laughs> I think years. And uh, and then <laughs> and then we had another sort of bumped into each other at one of the rare conferences I did go to. And um, and then he said, oh, you know, I'm going to email you about a thing. And then he did get in touch and say, look, I'm um, wanting to do a new, needing to do a new edition of First Steps. And I wanted to talk to you about being a co-author and helping me out and um, contributing um, and sort of talking through what that might look like. Um, so we met up and talked through some things and he had some quite big plans for how he wanted to change it. And um, then, I mean, I can't remember, remember whether Paula came on board. I mean, quite soon after that, Paula came on board and we, uh, to give us more perspective. You know, she's got lots of experience as a trainer. And so that was really valuable. And um, but then sort of COVID hit. And so we then had to sort of take the whole process of writing this book or rewriting it and editing it uh online and just doing this you know zoom calls and um uh and yeah thousands of emails probably yeah but it was i mean it was a it was a funny thing in the timing because i um around the time he asked me i think i was just i perhaps was around my 20th year of practice i'd been recently to the 20th anniversary um anniversary the um 20th reunion uh, for my training and uh, I was thinking had I already I think I was in the process of setting up private practice and sort of coming to the end of working at the college um, so all these things were sort of happening around the same time so there's a real sense of sort of transition in my work and in my working life and a sort of in a strange way a revisiting of the past because First Steps was the first counselling book I read alongside um, Person Centred Counselling in Action um, you know, two sort of seminal texts for UK counsellors, I think, you know, uh, trainee counsellors. Um, so to be invited to, you know, co-author that was just an amazing kind of honour, but, you know, also was a sort of signaling signaling for myself, a kind of transition into a new part, new phase of my um, career. I don't, don't like that word, but yeah, but, you know, my life as a therapist. So, um, yeah, so it's very uh, had a, all these kind of emotional threads to it, as well as just being a sort of good thing to be involved in, and taking a lot of work. You know, as I'm sure you're aware, sort of as I know you're aware, <laughs> writing a book is is you know a hard thing to do. So um, uh, yeah, but it was yeah, so it was a great experience in lots of ways. An amazing achievement. And of course, you know, students, if you're watching, have a look at your reading list. It's going to be there. Um, absolutely brilliant book. And it was just good to see that kind of, um, yeah, relaunch of it. And, um, you know, and obviously have people like you being involved. Um, I was thinking, when did it come out? Was it 2022 or 2021? Yeah, uh, good question. 2022, I think. But obviously within a few months Pete died so um and I think this was part of he he had been unwell for a long time so part of Paula and I becoming involved was a kind of handing on the baton and you, you know and this book was really Pete's baby it was like you know the the thing that had kept PCC at PCCS books the publisher going and uh, and had become this kind of amazing kind of resource uh this sort of really you know loved by uh, many many people who do the training so um yeah there was a real honor in that but it, obviously so that was it's mixed with a kind of deep kind of sadness and loss um for him and um to i mean i i felt like i wrote something in an obituary for therapy today that i felt like i met pete a bit late we've been sort of aware of each other but we, you know spending all that time together on the book uh had a real connection and a real sense of a, a sort of comrade in things and um uh but i'll always remember you know if i don't know if you met him but it's sort of incredible kind of sense of humor sort of like uh and we would do a lot of laughing as well as working so i'll i'll take that from it you know um absolutely like you say such an honor and and also 
a huge responsibility that he was entrusting uh, you and Paula with as well. Um, yeah, I hear you. Um, I'm not going to add to it. All I'm going to say is Paula's a partner as well, Paul Wilkins. I don't know whether you knew him, but he also died the same year. Um, so I was really thinking about that when I was thinking about this book. Um, mm. But yeah, what a legacy. Yeah, amazing legacy. And hopefully we can do it justice going forward. Um as you say, a big responsibility. I do occasionally have a sort of slightly anxious waking dream of when PCCS are going to get in touch and say we need a new edition and <laughs> have like to find the time to, because it's, I mean, it, the, uh, I was doing it in COVID. The one benefit was there wasn't, I wasn't doing much work. So you know, I had all this time to work on it, but um, yeah, I'll, we'll come to that when it happens. So, yeah, Catherine Jackson, if you're watching, um, give us <laughs> plenty of notice. Yeah, plenty of notice, please. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're going to finish up soon. But I guess I uh, I wanted to just ask you uh, such an important question for therapists. You mentioned your support systems earlier. But what is it that keeps you grounded, keeps you happy as a person? Mm. I don't know. Am I happy as a person? That's a good question. Ah, yeah. Uh, happy, semi happy. <laughs> uh, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, po I remember I posted a bit, a slightly kind of edgy thing on Threads about self care and what, and therapists always saying that they meditate and and go for the walks in woods and and do all these kinds of nice things, um, which I also, I mean, I don't meditate. I have done in the past and I do love walking in the woods and I love being by the sea and uh, those kinds of experiences uh, but I wanted to sort of like inspire you know encourage people to sort of is that all we do do we always do wholesome things and I'm not sure we always do um, and and my little bit of the the non-wholesome thing I do is uh, I, I mean I just really enjoy intelligent horror films so mm -hmm. and uh I did I, in the in the post. I did say that, I, and there's nothing better than a horror film and a whiskey cocktail. So, I mean, there's it, it a bit of mischief in there. You know, it's trying to, um, but uh, more deeply, I think it's. Uh, I, I mean, for me, it's like I spend a lot of time not with therapists. You know, I don't, and that and that's important for me. And I'm not saying it's the right or wrong way to be, but uh, you know, my my family are sort of very grounding you know um in that respect uh, i don't my my friends that i socialize with are mostly non-therapists i have one very good friend who's an ex-therapist who um we i trained with and practiced for 20 years before she retired um but mostly spending time away from all that you know to and that, that that's okay we don't have to be sort of doing deep personal work or reading heavy books. I mean, I read a lot of heavy books, but, you know, we don't have to be doing that sort of thing all the time, you know, have a lightness, you know, in your life too, you know, just be able to laugh and muck about and, um, and you know, not think deep thoughts. And I mean, I find that quite difficult because I'm, I'm quite drawn to seriousness and melancholy. And, you know, I think it just inherently as a person somehow. Um, but it's so it's, so that's really valuable to me to have sort of love and light in your life alongside your your practice but I do read a lot of dark books you know like heavy books therapy books but also I like sort of dark uh contemporary kind of literature and um I say dark I'm not really sure what I mean by that but but not romantic fiction <laughs> some, some things like it was with some heft to it uh, I mean, right, I like... when you said the horror films, not rom coms, horror films. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the equivalent. <laughs> I know what impression I'm giving about myself here, but, but it's all, you know, it's true. So uh, I think I like to be challenged a bit, you know, and and um, uh, I mean, I have a deep kind of passion for music, uh, which just goes way back. It was like music was one of my sort of best friends, if you like, growing up. And, um, and and I think and I listen to a lot of music, but I think too much about music. Probably, I read a lot of kind of writing about music. I mean, I love like, really good music writing is a sort of amazing art form in itself. And and I just found I can really lose myself in that. And um, uh, so and I listen to 
you know, I don't just have music on. I'll, I I I listen to music, you know, and uh, and I'm sort of thinking about the music and the construction of it and the uh, and the elements to it. And yeah, I can become very boring very quickly about the about music and and, and what it means. Um, in fact, the piece I'm writing at the moment, trying to talk about the not knowing and practicing without using lots of you know therapist instigated interventions you know or exercises and activities um but i'm trying to draw on the work of uh, uh mark hollis who was a singer in a band talk talk in the 80s and um but made these amazing the last three albums these amazing albums at the end of his career um uh, which, which deal a lot with space and using a few core elements to to uh communicate something deeply human and um and full of like the you know potential of meaning and uh, so um okay, as i say i could talk about that stuff forever but but that but that's one of the great sort of sort of solo uh, solo joys in my life you know things i do privately just to uh um, i've always got when i'm writing i listen to a lot of um, ambient music but um certain kinds of ambient music like has to be a certain period of Brian Eno or something you know I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to me these are, so these aren't books behind me they're CDs so oh, oh brilliant <laughs> old school I've still got it like that too I think on that threads thing I actually had written that I was going to a live gig or something because I was like this is all about being human and you'd mentioned about music then so it's really nice I can hear when you talk just how passionately you feel mm. About, um, about that and I'll look forward to reading more about it in the next thing that you're that you're writing the next thing that's going to come come out um yeah um is there anything we haven't talked about that you wanted to say or I don't think there is no I mean it's just I, I I've just it's been lovely to have this opportunity to talk about some of these things and then uh, it makes me very reflective about my life I, I, never, I never really feel like a sort of senior person in the profession um because most of the time I'm just you know getting on with the job you know like a lot of us and um and you know occasionally kind of banging away on my keyboard and trying to write something but um yeah to look back and think it's been a quarter of a century over half my life I've been doing this um yeah I mean it's really quite striking and seeing the changes but things that have stayed the same and um and despite all the angsty stuff the campaigning the the way our profession conducts itself terribly at times I you know I never lose hope really mm -hmm. my, my old tutor always had this thing that he would say that he's not optimistic but he remains hopeful which I, I just think is really captures it for me, you know, that there's much to be concerned about in the world, you know, as well, you know, not least that the planet's on fire, you know, and the human extinction is possible, you know, but um, so there's, no, there's nothing really to be optimistic about, but there is something to be hopeful about, you know, but it's to retain a kind of hope as a principled stance in the face of, all the terrible things that are happening i think because if you can't hold hope then what it is there you know there's no what's the point in anything so yeah and that that seems to me to be at the heart of therapeutic practice really um so keep the faith keep hope everyone it's a good that's a good note to end on uh, thank you so much andy i've really enjoyed this chat you are someone i find very very inspirational myself and so actually to talk to you properly is a bit of an honor for me so thank you um, oh, thank you so much let's talk again well, we, we shall we must not, not just on twitter <laughs> not just not exactly off social media yeah definitely yeah. thank you andy rogers thank you everyone for watching